Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of our program. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. Today we have with us John Pollock, who is with Financial Gravity. John, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Hey, so I love um, short, succinct company names or, and, and business names. So financial gravity, obviously <clears throat> financial, and then gravity is a nice action word. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, your company, Financial Gravity. What uh, uh, led you to get into this uh, industry? Well, I started out as in wealth management, and then I went to solve a problem that I was having. I started paying a lot of money in taxes because I was doing well, and I wanted to solve that problem. And uh, the CPA industry did not solve it for me. They, I basically learned that they're historians. They record what I've done. They're not real good at helping me do it differently so that I can lower my taxes. So I, financial gravity was born out of that. And the idea was is that gravity is an unseen force in the universe. Mm. Um, if I jump off a building and choose not to believe in gravity, I'm still going to experience it. <laughs> so... <laughs> so that was the idea behind financial gravity, that are these, these unassailable financial laws that exist, and gravity can actually be used for you, uh, to help you. For instance, air flight doesn't suspend gravity, it actually uses the force of gravity, and then adds speed and lift and thrust to fly, and it eliminates those three things to land. So you're actually using gravity to fly, not suspending it. So we figured that there are laws within the financial system that we could use to personally fly um, and increase our wealth and that type of stuff. So that's where the idea came from of financial gravity, and the business kind of grew out of my need to lower taxes. So we now help companies, help small business owners lower their personal income taxes. Yeah, and you know, I love that what you said, the, the two words, solve a problem. And so many times, you know, you see uh, business uh, exposés or stories or, you know, even on Shark Tank, things like that, where it's like, I just had this thing and I couldn't find it anywhere. And you had an actual problem. And, you know, people are motivated more from something negative or a problem than motivated by something that is a little bit more positive. So it's going to capture someone's attention. So you had that problem and you're like, ouch, that hurts. How can I fix this thing? And lo and behold, you figured out a way to fix it. And you're like, if you could, or if you had that problem, maybe other people do. So um, at the very beginning, what were, what was some of the um, responses to people that you were talking to? Were, were they kind of like clamoring and saying, yep, I've got that same thing and, and hallelujah, there's a solution. And, and then of course, now there's competition and all that, but you've set yourself apart from that over the years. Well, there really isn't that a lot of competition still. It's, it's wow. the, the biggest competition we have is apathy and a belief in a kind of a mythical system. This mythical system is the CPA industry saves money on taxes, and they don't. In fact, the A in CPA is accounting, and if you look up accounting in Webster's, it's to account for something. Basically, it's to record data. And so where I got a lot of traction with uh, other small business owners was, you know, is it just me or is your CPA not really good at, tax planning. And I kept getting over and over again, yeah, it's like I have to come to them with the idea and then they'll, you know, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And that just didn't seem right. I thought the, the accountant was supposed to give me the advice. You know, and in defense of accountants, they're not trained for that. The CPA yeah. exam is 14 hours and there's not a single question on tax planning. They are not trained to do tax planning. So the interest, the business problem I'm solving is the fact that everybody thinks an entire industry does a thing that, that the industry does not do, which is kind of a weird business problem to be dealing with. Yeah, you know, I, I want to ask the question, um, uh, at what point should a business be scratching the head thinking, maybe I need some of that? But um, before I ask that question, I want to just touch on what you just said and just make sure that, that people understand that there is a difference um, between a you know CPA and an, an enrolled agent, an accountant. Can you give us like a 30,000-foot view of, of what some of those distinctions are? Yeah, so CPA, the P in CPA is public. 
So originally, a CPA was to be taught general accounting principles for publicly traded companies. And then that kind of bled into the individual small business owner that's also a CPA. CPA is, is, is expanded, but they are accountants. And EA is actually registered with the U.S. Treasury to do tax returns. So an EA actually is trained to handle tax returns, but neither of them are proactive tax planners. Hmm. So there's this belief that if someone touches a tax return, then they must know how to move money or move money around or numbers around on it, and it's just it's not true. So that's one of our biggest hurdles is letting people know that the they're not getting the advice that they need, um, and as a result, they're losing tens of thousands of dollars. It's, it's people's biggest single exp- expense is taxes, and yet no one's really targeting how we lower them legally. You know, we don't. You can just not yeah. pay it, but that would be tax evasion, <laughs> and that's illegal. Yep. We don't want that. Yeah, yeah, we want to work within the confines of, of everything. But but isn't it true also that if you had someone that came to you and said, I just wonder um, if if uh, I'm my guy's doing the right thing or my, my tax preparer's doing the right thing, can't you go backwards and look three years, and then if you found some opportunities, isn't three years the, the time frame window that you could go back in and do some amendments for mistakes? But then you could say, now let's, you know, starting today, let's look forward and not let this happen again and capture some of these things. Because I'm sure that there's some things you would look backwards in three years and go, they just missed this. We can't go, you know, um, it's kind of like backdating. We can't go backdate right. something. So we're only looking backwards for mistakes that we can capture, uh, uh, get some, some correction on. But from here on out, we need to be doing X, Y, and Z to make sure we capture these things that should have been done backwards. So the way we explain it to people, there's really not a lot of stuff you can do backwards, but we can use the stuff from the backwards to project forwards. Because if we know how you're living your life, we can see if that information is inside of your tax return. For example, uh, you can rent your house to yourself tax-free. It's part of the tax code. It's been in there for decades. It's one of the 70,000 pages that's amongst the tax code. It's super easy to implement, and it will save you thousands of dollars in taxes. The problem is is that chances are you haven't already done that. Therefore, we cannot go back and add that. So the way I explain it is is the December 31st is like a really tall wall. And you can throw some things over that wall, but not a lot of things. And the longer, the further you get away from the wall, the harder it is to throw something over. So in other words, if it's March of a new year, you can do an IRA and throw that money over the wall and save a little bit of money. But you can't do an IRA for three years ago now yep. because it's too late. So there's most of the planning has to be forward-looking. We do sometimes find little things, but it has to be forward-looking. The biggest case that we run into quite frequently is people come to us after they've sold a business, have hundreds of thousands of dollars in potential taxes, and then want help. Yeah, and yeah. we say – Every single time, you got you got to call us before the business is sold. We can we can eliminate 100% of the taxes on the sale of a business if you get to us before you sell it. Can't do anything. But, after. but it's already been triggered when the sale happens. So too bad, so sad. You, you, you got to think just a little bit forward. Um, so I think that's a really that that goes to my question that I was uh, alluding to, which is what are some things or triggers that business owners would need to think? Ooh, I need to. And you just touched on one right there. If you're thinking about um, selling your business, and I interviewed someone just last week on um, he helps businesses prepare to sell their business and and sometimes even do it themselves. Well, there's a lot of things that go into preparing your business to look best for sale and all of that, but but one of the things they should be doing is talking to someone like yourself to make sure all of the tax strategies are in place so that when that sale triggers, that there's as little um, liability as possible, maybe not zero, but but as little as possible. So that that's an excellent point. Yeah, I mean, that's, so the, the, it's, it's forward-thinking planning that works in business in general, and it's no different for taxes. So people should not be planning their taxes uh, and around April 15th, that is not the time to plan. It's too late. So yep. that's why we keep using the word over and over again, proactive, because it's got you have to be forward-looking. And we save, on average, for our average clients, $21,000 per year. So why wouldn't you want to solve for that? 
And that's a lot and, of money. And when for you a say lot of average, what what revenue? Like for instance, you might have some uh, uh, entrepreneurs that say, "Wow, that's awesome." What revenue in the business would would approximately you need to be at to think, well, I might be able to to have some sort of a savings in that realm. You know, do you have to be a ten million dollar a year business to see that, or could you be a four hundred thousand dollar a year revenue business to see something like that? So we tell people to start looking for help on tax planning when they hit a hundred thousand dollars in gross revenue, which is really low, not net gross. Um, if you're not paying at least five thousand dollars in taxes, then we can't help you. Obviously, if we're saving on average $20,000, people are paying more than $20,000. Yep. <laughs> um, and then can you clarify, too, what you meant about rent your house to yourself? Um, so if you are the business, you're saying that the business would rent the house to the individual, or is that backwards? No, yeah. No, that's actually correct. So it's, it's uh, sometimes known as the Augusta rule. It's only 14 days. You can't do a 15 because if you do a 15, then you lose the 14. So no more than 14 days. So let's use a simple example. Let's say that uh, you have me over and I do this interview in your house. And as a result, you're now renting your house for the space to do interviews. So you decide that based on, and we help people with this, but you decide that that's worth $1,000 a day. So then you pay yourself from the business. The money comes out of the business at 1000 bucks. And then it goes into your personal checking account, and you have to record on a tax form that that happened, but you don't have to pay taxes as its income. This is really great for people that are doing Airbnb. So yep. if they're doing Airbnb and they're, they're running out of room for 14 of the days, it's tax-free. Yeah. And, and don't know that. does that then trigger, like in the old days, I remember – hearing that, well, you know, if you run your business out of your house you and you want to do a deduction, it you've got to get down to the square inch, and if you use it for personal, then you're in trouble, and then it kicks into, you know, when you sell the house. then So that's a whole different animal then. That is a myth that has somehow been perpetuated <laughs> by the accounting industry. There are five different ways in the Internal Revenue Code to write off a home office. So I always like to ask, if there's five ways of doing it, why is it a red flag? Yeah. I mean, if there was no ways of doing it and we tried to do it, that would be a red flag. But having a lot of different ways of doing it, in fact, it's not even square footage anymore. You can actually write off based on your rooms. So we call it, it's called business use percentage. So you can either do square footage of the room that you're using or you can do the number of rooms. So we joke with people that in Texas, we don't use the square footage because our houses are big. So mm -hmm. we'd rather use, you know, a three-bedroom, two-bed ha house in Texas, maybe, you know, 10,000 square feet. Um, but in New York, it's only 1,000 square foot. So yep. they want to use the square footage versus the rooms. And that was built into the code because of that very reason. So it's, it, you can write off your swimming pool even. So it's, it's, there's, there's all these little tiny things in the code. There's 70,000 pages. So there's bigger things. There's there's one strategy where we can stash a million dollars a year tax free. You know, if you're making that kind of money, and you're you're in the 60 to 70 percent tax bracket, so you're in the you're in the 50 federal. Most people don't know this, but there's 39.6 plus 3.8, and then there's about another five percent in phase out rules. So you're ending up right around 50 percent on the tax code. You add in a state tax, you're close to 60 percent. So if you earn a million dollars, you've got to pay $600,000 in taxes, and you only keep 400000 What if you can take that million and stash it? Now, all of a sudden, you get to keep the whole million. So, and it doesn't increase audit risk because it's, it, these are legitimate tax strategies. The tax code was written basically for it's a control mechanism. Congress wants you to use these strategies because they think it's good for society. So now there's 70000 you know, things in this isn't um, your type of advice pretty timely anyway, of course, but everything you see these days on the business shows is talking about, oh, the small business owner is getting crushed because of, and fill in the blank with a whole litany of yeah. things, right? Minimum wage and workers' comp and health care, all these things. Well, it, shouldn't that be a trigger that every time someone thinks that, kind of like Pavlov's dog, you know, you, you hear the bell, you see the dog salivates. Well, when pe business owners hear those things, shouldn't they think, well, 
maybe um, maybe I don't have as much trouble getting money into the financial bucket, but let me see if I can plug some of these holes. Yeah, and it's a, and it's a really really big hole. So a lot of business owners, let's say I have a sub shop, and you know I'm I'm trying to cut my costs on turkey. Um, that's a small, you know, I can find something for a dollar twenty a pound instead of a dollar ten a, or a dollar fifty a pound. So I don't, I save a little bit of money on my turkey, but I'm not saving a ton. Meanwhile, they're paying tens of thousands of dollars a year in taxes, and nobody's targeting how do I solve that. It's because we've been taught, hey, there's two certainties in life: death and taxes. It's just not completely true. Um, Taxes are a certainty, but you do not have to pay. The code is built so that you don't have to pay as much as you're probably paying. So when when someone does um, get away from, uh, and I love your point about um, some of your biggest competition is apathy, because I teach marketing strategy for three universities, and one of the, um, you know, concepts is, let's talk about our, you know, uh, competitive advantage, our target audience. Well, sometimes when you think about your competitors, an indirect competitor, because a lot of people think, oh, my competitor's Joe down the street or Fred on the internet, but a an indirect competitor could be apathy. It could be, um, you know, like if you are a bowling alley, your indirect competitor could be the movie theater. And you're like, wait a minute, my competitor is another bowling alley. Uh Uh-uh. It's another thing that would take you away from doing what, you know, it could be a putt-putt. So when someone gets away from the competition of either, you know, one of your direct or indirect competitors and they say, okay, let me, let me decide to come with you. What are some of the most um, frequent questions that they ask right off the bat? Because I'm sure that that people are going, but my guy should have told me, and and we covered that earlier, but what are some of the more specific questions that they're going to, they're going to ask you? The number one question we get is, is this going to increase my audit risk? Mm, And the answer is actually the exact opposite. It reduces audit risk. For example, a sole proprietor is five times more likely to be audited than an S-Corp. So just switching you from a sole proprietor to an S-Corp not only lowers your taxes because it could uh, could eliminate the self-employment tax, so you eliminate an entire tax, um, but it also lowers your risk by 500%. So... It's, it's once again, it's a myth that, that, that yeah. if you try to use the tax code, you're going to get audited. But the, the IRS is a collection agency. They collect the people with the most amount of income. If I lower your income by using the tax code, then you're less of a target. Hmm. Yeah. Most and, people and, don't and, know that. It's, just, it's another one of those things. It's just the, the, the accounting industry is, I don't know, I just think they're lazy. They, they are so busy trying to get the tax returns done that they don't have the time to do anything else. So they just focus on what we call compliance, putting the, the numbers in boxes. They don't have the time to do anything else. And if they do something else, then it creates work for them. Oh, great. Now i got to set up an IRA, which means i got to put that number in a different box. I just won't do anything so I can get this tax return done and out the door. So it's, just, it's a frustrating thing. I, didn't, I couldn't believe that it was a hole in the marketplace. But it is, and you know it's a big hole, and we're driving a Mack truck through it. So, and that's that's awesome. And I love I love when uh, people can be like those you know trendsetters. And, and and in reality, here's a here's a term I think that you will appreciate that that applies to you, um, disrupting an industry. Yeah, we're disrupting several industries. There's actually three major industries that we're disrupting, and that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's, well, if people you know, want to learn somebody, more if about, if we don't do our job well, someone's going to disrupt us. Yep, so that's, exactly. That's our job. So yeah. let's let's wrap up with how can people learn about how you disrupting an industry can uh, help their business save money, plan their taxes in ways that are very ethical and fitting within the tax code. But you're letting things slipping through the cracks right now. So what is the best way that people can learn more? So they can go to financialgravity.com, which is our main website. There's a free ebook offer on there. Um, we also have a free video series at lowertaxhigherprofit.com. Um, but if you go to the, the website, financialgravity.com, that will lead you to the free ebooks and the free video series and all the stuff that's available to you. Excellent. Well, um, most definitely, we really appreciate your time. Wonderful learning more about you and your business and, and how it impacts us small businesses. And thank you so much for all that you do for the industry. Thank you for having me.
You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.